Today's show is brought to you by CBT Nuggets. You know how much we value ongoing education on the Cloudcast, and CBT Nuggets is exactly what Aaron and I wish we had when we were trying to get our certification early in our careers. CBT Nuggets is all about bringing a personalized touch to learning about cloud computing, virtualization, networking, DevOps, and much, much more. Whether it's their hands-on labs with personalized coaching or the online chat functions that come up with every instructor-led course, CBT Nuggets' team of experts is always there to help you get the most from your training and your PASA certification. You can check it all out at cbtnuggets.com slash cloudcast and sign up for a free trial. You get access to the full catalog of great training, including virtual labs, quizzes, and other premium features completely free for the first seven days. That's cbtnuggets.com slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Lots and lots of data for cloud news this week. And so because of that, I'm going to jump right into it. First of all, we want to talk about some funding rounds, um, venture capital and, and funding rounds. Uh, we kind of went through a bit of a drought, at least kind of in cloud in the emerging tech space. Uh, but Lots to talk about here all of a sudden. Um, Alexio, uh, in-memory file system, $50 million C round. Planet Scale Data and Vitesio, uh, database scaling, $50 million C round. Uh, BitDev, component-driven app dev, $25 million B round. And Dragster IO data orchestration, $14 million A round. So first of all, congrats to all of them. And as we're always on the lookout for more guests, hopefully we'll be able to get some of these folks on the show before too much longer as well. And continuing on in our uh, kind of theme of data, lots and lots of data this week, we have uh, GitHub. GitHub released their 2021 State of the Octoverse report. And if you've been following Cloud News of the Week, you you know we, we kind of love these reports with lots of facts and figures to kind of dig into here. It starts off, uh, and I'm actually scrolling and looking at it, uh, you know, right as I record this. First of all, 73, 73 million total developers on GitHub, 16 million new users in 2021. So huge, huge growth still used for, by 84% of fortune 100 companies. And it kind of goes on from there. Lots and lots of stats, 170 million pull requests merged in 2021, for instance. Now, some of the stats though, I will say no surprise, right? Uh, which, you know, areas of the world are using them, that's pretty stable and has been the top 10 languages, uh, really stable, um, very few, if any, changes from 2020 to 2021. But one that had a significant difference and is definitely worth talking about is about work and, and working where it is happening. Prior to the pandemic, 41% were co-located in an office uh, most of the time. Uh, only 28% were what we would call hybrid work, meaning some folks remote, uh, others in the office, and only 26% fully remote. Now, the pandemic, of course, changes a lot of that and, and probably changes these trends for a good while. Now, you know, we always hear talks of leadership and, and sea levels. Hey, I, we want to get everyone back into the office. But uh, many folks have proven that they can be effective and productive from many different locations. And it also helps a bit sometimes with the work-life balance as well once we got through figuring this out and everything that went with it. So what do the stats look like now? Uh, only 10.7% co-located, so down from 41%. 47.6 hybrid versus 28.1 prior. And 38.8 fully remote uh, going forward. So really significant changes in there. I, again, nothing probably surprising 
to anyone there, but I think it is um, nice to see the data and, and that backed up in the results in the survey for this year. Again, lots and lots of, of data here. You can go download the PDF. Uh, it goes into uh, much more in depth uh, and kind of goes into the tech as well. It's a pretty good report. Next, we have um, our friends over at uh, the uh, developer community. They did a DevRel salary um, and um, a, a report on that and really broke it down, probably much more so than any other report I've seen. So if you are in the DevRel community and you would like to see some details from your peers on, on salary, on specializations, on countries, lots and lots of breakdowns of the data in many different ways. I mean, it's probably, oh gosh, 10 plus different ways in which this is broken down. Um, I don't think anything big, big and surprising here, though. Open source and cloud uh, kind of vying for number one and number two with the majority uh, of the respondents showing that as their focus areas. API, developer tooling, DevOps, uh, really being the other big ones as well. So again, if that data is of interest to you, the link is in the show notes. And lastly, what we're going to talk about today is actually, um, it's kind of made the rounds on the internet. The visual capitalists, and this is something they do every year. Every minute of every day, what is going on with some of the big uh, platforms on the internet? And even my 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 kids <laughs> got a kick out of this one and, and actually sent me this as well. So Cloud News of the Week sponsored by my kids. Take some of these. It's just mind boggling. Google, 5.7 million searches per minute. Netflix, uh, 452,000 hours streamed uh, per minute. Instagram, uh, users sharing 65,000 photos and TikTok, uh, 167 million videos, uh, per minute every day. And it kind of goes on and on. And, and, you know, Slack, Slack users, um, 148,000 messages. And I don't know if, it, if you're like me, but, uh, I feel like that number is almost low considering how many damn Slack messages I get all the time. Um, but uh, if you're interested in that data, again, link is in the show notes and really fascinating to see the trends over time as well. So with that, we're going to wrap up Cloud News of the Week. Right after the break, we're going to be talking about uh, recaps, recaps of the recent GitHub Universe and Microsoft Ignite 2021 conferences. And that's coming up right after the break. Today's show is sponsored by Megaport. Are you looking for an easier way to connect all your clouds that you're using? With Megaport's network as a service platform, you can spin up private connectivity to as many clouds as you want anywhere in the world in minutes, not months. All the world's top cloud service providers such as AWS, Azure, Google are already on the network and at your fingertips. And it's all software defined, no hardware necessary. Just point, click, and connect. So if you're looking for a way to improve network performance and security, lower cloud cost, and turn up hybrid cloud and multi-cloud connections quickly and easily, Megaport is the cloud connectivity solution for you. Learn more at megaport.com. That's megaport.com. Reimagine connectivity. Today's show is sponsored by BMC. And BMC wants to know, is your business on its A-game? The A-game is when systems are intelligent by learning from markets, where automation is paramount yet effortless, and when technology and people work as one in an enterprise. The A-game is your business at its absolute best. BMC calls this the autonomous digital enterprise. Find out more at bmc.com slash A-game. That's bmc.com slash A-game. And we're back. And, you know, as, as Aaron mentioned at the top of the show, one of the things we want to do, and, and we've done this for a number of years for the uh, for the AWS reInvent show, is kind of do a recap of the show. Um, you know, and I think... Uh, Thinking about it, we really should have done this for Azure, uh, probably starting a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I think to a certain extent, we we always recapped the AWS show partially because uh, they were always the largest cloud. Uh, they always kind of drew the most attention, um, and their show was always you know very very cloud centric. Right, there was it was you know kind of all cloud all the time, and I think the reality is that um, you know while we could probably cover a lot of shows, um, you know, the Azure show, uh, the Azure Microsoft Ignite and GitHub Universe shows, um, while they're different shows, we probably should start covering them together. They do tend to uh, happen around the same time. And, and the reality is, 
um, Azure as a whole, for however they account for all their numbers, uh, is getting fairly close to AWS. Um, so, you know, they're still probably number two. Um, I guess if you added all sorts of things together, you could probably say they're neck and neck. But, uh, you know, for the most part, I think it does us and our community a uh, good service to really kind of cover uh, the the Microsoft uh, angle as well, not just AWS. You know, we, I think we used AWS as sort of a, a lighthouse, and, and to a certain extent, we sort of would say, well, okay, um, you know, here's what's going on with AWS, and yes, a lot of the other clouds have similar kinds of types of capabilities, but if we cover one, um, you know, folks have a pretty good idea of what's going on. But I think, you know, it would do us good to, uh, to spend at least, you know, one show a year, just like we do with AWS, covering the Azure show. So let's go ahead and dive into that. Um, we put a couple of, sh- of links in the show notes uh, that have the full and complete list of announcements, uh, as well as the links to the keynotes, if you didn't have a chance to listen to the, either one of those for both uh, Microsoft Ignite, as well as GitHub Universe. Um, it's nice they put uh, everything in one place for us, so we don't have to go through 50, 60 blogs. Um, AWS tends to uh, want to give us the Jeff Barr treatment of uh, one blog per service. Um, AWS or Azure does that as well, but they uh, at least do a nice summary blog for us. So we put those in the show notes for you. I want to kind of go through a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Satya Nadella uh, gave a very nice keynote. Um, he really hit on on four topics. He really said, you know, there's there's four key things that we're really focused on. Um, the first one is hybrid work. Really looking at, um, you know, what does it mean to be some combination of both uh, in person and remote? And, and you know. Um, you know, there's there's a large number of people that want to work uh, remote. There's also a very large number of people that want to work in person or some combination of the two. And so they really spend some time, um, you know, looking at their collaboration services, how they think about this. Um, it's both a combination of their collaboration services as well as the cloud. Um, and I think it was a strong piece for them to come out. And obviously, it's a it's an area where they have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of users, a lot of customers. Um, but it's you know it's a reality for a lot a lot of companies, especially you know everything from enterprises to small, medium, um, and everything in between. The second thing that was on their list was what they call hyper-connected businesses, right? The idea of, you know, now that we live in this world that's been impacted by the by the COVID pandemic, um, who knows, uh, you know, how long-lasting that will be, but the idea that, you know, people expect now to be able to connect with your business uh, with any device, uh, anywhere they want at any given time, uh, they want delivery options. They want interaction options. They want the interaction options to be, uh, in some cases, live. In some cases, bots. In some cases, you know, all sorts of things. So they really sort of dove into what that means to be a hyper-connected business, um, and kind of all the move that they expect to see from shifting from sort of reactive type of responses to more proactive. Whether that's proactive marketing, which you know folks don't necessarily love, but it's a reality of business to, you know, all sorts of other things proactive that could impact supply chain and could impact how teams collaborate, all sorts of things like that. The third thing was really what they called uh, digital business, really kind of, um, you know, digital transformation, but really just sort of the digitization of everything in business. And this was really where they talked about their, their multi-cloud strategy, their multi-edge strategy. Uh, obviously, they brand this as Azure Arc, but uh, you know, really kind of getting into what does it mean when every aspect of your business starts to become digital, and obviously, this is something that's been going on for you know 15 years or so in our industry. But uh, we really are at a point where uh, things like you know enhanced data at the edge, uh, AI, ML, those types of things really can become very, very. Um, relevant uh, in you know all sorts of aspects of what we do from mobile applications to edge to data center to cloud to all sorts of places and then finally the last thing that he talked about was what he called protect everything or sort of end-to-end security and obviously this was very much uh, you know touching on all of the uh, cyber attacks that we've seen lately the software supply chain uh, attacks that we've seen over and over again uh, especially over the last couple of years and, and obviously with people working everywhere you know kind of bringing it back to hybrid work um, you know, we no longer really have edges of defense. We no longer have moats. We no longer have firewalls, uh, you know, being kind of the, the perimeter of what we do. And so how do we think about, um, you know, the fact that uh, we interact with software all over the place and those types of things. So a uh, really in- interesting keynote. Um, you know, we've we've mentioned this show a few times. We've, we are really, really impressed with, with uh, what Satya Nadella has been able to do to transform Microsoft over the last uh, seven, eight years. And, uh, you know, he continues to, to lay out a vision. Now, I highlighted all that because, you know, their approach to talking about what they want to do is very different than uh, AWS and Google. Um, you know, AWS, I think, very much 
Uh, we'll see what happens with the upcoming new uh, reinvent uh, with Mr. Slipsky taking over for Andy Jassy and kind of the, the direction that he takes for the keynote and where they go. But, you know, their approach has always been uh, about builders, about kind of lots and lots of individual services and, and giving people uh, a variety of tools to try and solve problems. And, you know, that, that's one approach. Obviously, it's, it's worked very, very, very well for them. Uh, Microsoft tends to take an approach that is much more kind of speaking, um, you know, kind of walking the line between speaking to the business, speaking, understanding the business, bringing solutions, less, you know, kind of a combination of services, uh, cloud services and solutions. Um, you know, they're a little more flexible about the definition of the cloud, what cloud means, edge cloud, multi-cloud, and so forth. So it's interesting to just to sort of contrast the two companies. Um, I think, it, you know, again, it goes back to their roots of, um, you know, how they build their cloud, how they think about interacting with their customers and so forth. So let's dive into some of the bigger announcements, both from Azure and GitHub. And I'm not going to read through all of them, uh, but let's go ahead and go through them. You know, I think the thing that really jumps out at me when I look at the the Azure announcements, the things that Microsoft talks about, um, you know, they don't tend to kind of overwhelm you with, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of new announcements. I mean, they do have a good number of announcements, probably 40 or so. But they tend to kind of fall into the same categories, right? They tend to sort of go, we're going to try and do a few things really well. Uh, We know that people can't um, be experts in everything. So we're going to kind of focus on certain areas and try and enhance those areas more than just constantly uh, adding more and more new services, right? So I think there's a little bit of a different tone they tend to take versus, say, what AWS does. And I'm not going to try and compare the two. Uh, in every announcement. Um, You know, the first couple uh, that uh, they had out there, first one was um, the Azure OpenAI service, uh, which allows access to a number of GPT-3 models. Um, You know, uh, Microsoft has uh, made a number of announcements with uh, with OpenAI. Um, It's been part of some of the work that goes on uh, with GitHub as well. and so forth. So um, interesting to see that continue to uh, to expand. Um, they talked about the Azure Cognitive Service for language. So obviously, uh, a lot they bring together a number of services that are focused around language, whether it's text or uh, multiple languages. But kind of trying to bring those together into one studio, one suite of tools uh, around how to leverage cognitive services, AI and ML services, and so forth around different types of language, whether that's spoken or written. Um, the next was around what they call their Cosmos DB, uh, you know, kind of enhancements around Cosmos DB. This is really their uh, their scalable um, uh, scalable database service. Um, next one on the list was, you know, something that they touch on, not something that uh, they do not necessarily as much as, as AWS does, but uh, an Azure managed instance of Apache Cassandra. So, you know, both how to bring in Cassandra data into Cosmos DB, but also for those that are running Cassandra, uh, a managed version of that as well is out there. And then there's Synapse Analytics, uh, which they really kind of position as being this sort of uh, limitless, uh, huge scale analytics service for all sorts of things, events and and other stuff like that. So really kind of their way of bringing in uh, all sorts of of event driven types of of applications and services and message buses and so forth. So um, interesting to see that continue to evolve. Now, as we start to get into some things that would sort of fall under cloud native, if you will, or containers, um, they launched something called the Azure Container Apps uh, into preview. And this is sort of, you know, can think about this a little bit as like, a, a PaaS-like service or a serverless type of service. So in essence, this is uh, containers under the covers, Kubernetes under the covers. Uh, you bring your code, um, it'll get put into a container. Um, you don't necessarily, as a developer, don't have to know anything about this. And then it just sort of sits there waiting for HTTP traffic. So it, it sort of blends together the best of kind of serverless in terms of um, I don't want to manage the operations and the scale of things like uh instances and load balancers and so forth. Um, but it does also bring together, you know, you can you can bring your own container, that types of thing. So interesting to see this as an evolution from the AKS uh, Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, a couple of announcements they made kind of on top of the AKS service uh, that were a little more enterprise centric. So they made an announcement of support for Oracle WebLogic on AKS, um, WebSphere Liberty, which is sort of the IBM version of, of um of WebSphere, uh, the newer, more open version for both AKS as well as the um, Azure Red Hat OpenShift service. And then uh, some enhancements to Azure DevHops, which kind of coincide and and, uh, work in conjunction with a lot of the work that's going on 
over in uh, GitHub Universe. So um, the other thing that they, they talked a lot about was the work that they're doing kind of in more of their Azure Arc service. So much more around uh, their HCI service. And this is really them trying to lay out an edge strategy as well as a multi-cloud or hybrid cloud strategy under the, the Arc umbrella. And what I find is interesting about this is, now the one thing they haven't really done um, as much as AWS um, is they haven't really kind of fully embraced the idea that they're going to own all the hardware uh, that goes out there. They still kind of have a dual strategy of, yes, we have some options that you can acquire from Microsoft, but also um, if you prefer one of their partner server vendors, so a Cisco, an HP, a Dell, uh, Supermicro, um, that's still an availability. And, and it'll be interesting to see how much one strategy wins versus the other. I think it does become more complicated as you're supporting more and more, but obviously Microsoft has a huge um, you know, install base uh, of having worked with, with all those server vendors in the past. So it gives them a few options for customers. But a lot of the work that they do in the uh, Azure HCI space or something that's called Azure Stack space um, is really around a couple of things. Number one, um, they do have some container offerings, but it's really focused around VMs, um, trying to make it simpler to get VMs, get storage, um, make it simpler to import and, and migrate things into those environments. Uh, SQL database as well is a huge focus area, a uh, number of enhancements around that space, and then some work around bringing Kubernetes, uh, you know, AKS-like functionality. So kind of um, the best of VMs, the best of containers, the best of SQL, um, and then, you know, beginning to dabble with a few of the other services on there. And again, this, I think, kind of doubles down on what I talked about earlier. You know, Azure, Microsoft tends to not overwhelm you with uh, a massive, massive number of services. Um, they still have a very robust number, but um, it's not kind of overwhelming because they know their install base, their customer base, you know, tends to sort of flock to the things they know really, really well. Now, on the GitHub side of things from the GitHub universe, um, again, a very different uh, perspective, you know, very, very developer centric. Um, and it's interesting the way that GitHub kind of lays things out. There's, there's a, a piece of what they do that's very individual developer centric, right? Like, how do we make an individual developer productive? Whether it's, you know, you get to customize your environment, whether it's the way that you do tagging, whether it's the way that, you know, we simplify, you're able to uh, deal with issues and communities and so forth. Then they sort of take it a step, a step further and they go, let's showcase how we uh, help you work within teams, within groups, within a project. And this is where you really start to get into, um, you know, more advanced capabilities where, you know, you can reuse uh, things that happen uh, in CI and CD pipelines. You can reuse templates for projects and so forth. Um, so things like code spaces. Um, you can begin to collaborate better with discussion groups, tagging things and so forth. And then you really get into sort of the sort of enterprise or corporate level way of thinking about developer productivity. And so um, they do a really nice job of kind of walking through the different personas without isolating any of them or sort of, um, you know, leaving them out. And then what they, they really kind of highlight is the way that they're evolving. And, you know, there's all the normal get things that go on, uh, merges and pull requests and better ways to do that. But then you really begin to see the things that they're, they're focused on, which is first and foremost, um, code spaces, you know, the idea that we want to build, uh, they want, you know, they want to give you an environment that is kind of pre-built for you that you can then customize. Um, you can reuse it as much as you want to, um, you know, and it gives you a place where kind of all the tools that you need are there, uh, developer productivity is sort of day one there, and you continue to see that improve. The next thing you see is around GitHub Actions, right? So um, the ability to integrate CI and CD services, the ability to take um, event-driven actions based on pull requests, on merges, on um, issues being resolved, on discussion topics, and all sorts of things. So you begin to see really this this blossoming of you know uh, GitHub understanding workflows, understanding what things people may want to trigger off of things that um, you know maybe uh, individual driven, group driven, and so forth. Um, and then you begin to see um, you know them doing a lot of work around. Uh, you know, customizing repositories. So again, you know, how do I bring on 50 developers? How do I help uh, this persona get replicated in, you know, two or three locations? How do I make it so that, you know, developers don't have to think about installing all these things on their machine? And, 
you know, I thought Red Monk, the folks at Red Monk made a really interesting observation. Um, it really sort of looks like we're, we're getting into a world where um, Apple is obviously trying to go after developers with their new uh, Mac One, uh, M1 Mac Pro, the, the new one that has like sort of the super chip in it, and GitHub trying to say, hey, we can do a lot of these things out of the cloud. And it's setting up to be a really interesting sort of dichotomy, not that the two can't work together, but you know, they're both very much going after the, do you want to develop locally or do you want to sort of develop in and for the cloud? And so it'll be interesting to watch those two things sort of come together. And then obviously there were some, some other things they talked about around improved issues and discussions and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, GitHub always does an awesome, awesome job of really laying out, you know, the experience and everything about the way that GitHub presents what they do is um, always in code, in demos, you know, it's always about the experience. It's always about how do we make you more productive? How do we give you better visibility of what's going on? How do we take distractions away from you? And I think they did a really, really good job. They continue to do a great job. Um, you know, and obviously they, uh, you know, continue to do very, very interesting things. So I'm going to wrap that up. Um, you know, like I said, if you really want to dive into any of these announcements, please take a look at the links in the show notes. Um, you know, I think, Microsoft did a very good job of talking about their growth. As we've mentioned, you know, they're continuing to grow about 40% year over year. Uh, very, very healthy growth. Um, they do a very good job of laying out kind of the interaction between the technology and the people and the business relevance. Um, I think they probably do that better than anybody else. Um, you know, and they're really bringing together their different properties, whether it's uh, Office 365, which we don't really touch on here, uh, whether it's the collaboration tools they've got going on, whether it's um, you know stuff going on with Teams and so forth, whether it's GitHub. And then obviously they had a whole section on Meta, uh, you know, kind of the Metaverse, if you will, not Meta, Facebook specific, but the Metaverse. And uh, we're going to dive into that kind of in an upcoming one, sort of the, the broader view of what's going on in this sort of emerging Metaverse and what it all means. But uh, Microsoft tried to lay out a very interesting vision of where they are. And they've done a lot of work in this space for probably 10 plus years. They have a lot of really interesting touch points. So uh, with that, I'm going to kind of wrap it up. Um, you know, kind of want to just give you an, an overview of the show, overview of what's going on with Microsoft. Obviously, they have become a bigger and bigger player in the cloud. Uh, for some people, they are the number one cloud. Others, they're number two. Um, but I think we needed to really give them their, their sort of due um, proper due, uh, the way that we've done with AWS for the last number of years. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks to everybody for listening. As always, thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for giving us all the great feedback and continue to give us suggestions and um, things that you'd like us to help uh, work on and improve. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 